Revelation chapter 3, who you listen to in life is vital to know your source of authority. Who we listen to. All of us listen to someone. In fact, in America, the, the pollsters tell us that the two groups most listened to in America are among the, the wealthy and powerful, they listen to their legal counsel, their lawyers, and among most normal people, they really listen to their doctors. And then everybody else is kind of on a lower, you know, it used to be clergy were up there and politicians and leaders, but it seems like that people are looking for financial and legal advice from, from that department, and they're looking for medical advice from those trusted doctors. So just for a moment, think about this. Think about if you got a hand-delivered letter, and it was from the combined doctors of, let's say, Johns Hopkins and the Mayo Clinic and maybe Boston General, and they were giving you a diagnosis of your condition, would they be authoritative enough to get your attention? Because that's, that's the concept Jesus gives in this this 14th verse of the third chapter. The question he's asking is, are you listening to Jesus? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they hear me and follow me and I know them. Who are we listening to? That's what he was asking Laodicea. Are you listening to Jesus? Jesus came on an unannounced visit to a church in Central Asia Minor 2,000 years ago and he wrote back a startling letter giving a diagnosis of their spiritual condition. And what's interesting is they did not think that he was an authority great enough to respond to. Because church history tells us that the church just ceased to exist. It just dissipated. In that letter, Jesus Christ starts with his credentials. And he says, your deteriorating spiritual health has come to my attention. And he introduces himself as the as the most authoritative person to speak to their need. You know, the medical advice of someone at work or school is nice. It's possibly helpful. You know, people always are trying to help us. And the medical advice of a trusted family member is nicer. It might be even more helpful. But the medical advice, the diagnosis and the prognosis from a trained, skilled, qualified, and almost universally trusted medical expert, like Johns Hopkins, Mayo, et cetera, et cetera, would be foolish to ignore and Jesus is saying, I'm coming to you. And, and what he does in verse 14, we're going to read it in a minute, is he introduces himself with three successive titles. It's kind of like the letterhead, you know, a fellow of the American College of da 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 da, da you know, to show that he is an expert as he speaks. The diagnosis and treatment regimen, which is written in chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, is spiritual wellness from the greatest authority in the universe. He says, I am the creator that designed you. I'm the redeemer that bought you and owned you. I'm the judge who has the final say over your life. Are you going to listen? They should have listened. But what's interesting is the letter was, was appended with these words, all the churches are to hear. So this morning, it's not just the Laodiceans that should have listened. The question incumbent on each of us is, are we listening to the voice of Jesus. Jesus introduces himself in verse 14 as the God we can trust and we should listen to him. Jesus can be trusted. Jesus is reliable. Jesus says, no one else is like me. I am the amen of God. I am the perfect witness. If you're going to live by faith, I know where you're headed. I can witness to you what you're going to face. Jesus calls himself by these titles and as we read this letter, notice the emphasis on him saying and us hearing, on him saying and us hearing, and on those who hear that they are to respond. Because Jesus said, if you're my sheep, which we all claim to be by being here this morning, you should hear my voice and follow what I say. So let's listen to what he says. Revelation 3, starting verse 14, all the way down to 22. Let's stand together and listen with our hearts to Christ's words this morning. Verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says, so he said, I'm, it's like I'm speaking this to you. These things says the amen, 
That's title one. The faithful and true witness. That's title two. The beginning of the creation of God. So that's the intro. Verses 15 to 19, we're covering. Those are the seven habits. We've read them many times. Now look at verse 20. Look at this continued emphasis. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. See, listen. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who are you listening to? Who we listen to determines everything about our eternal destiny. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they do what I say. And we should listen to him this morning. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you would open our spiritual ears. There are so many voices around us. It's just like over, over voices, over choices, over sounds and sights and words. We just live in a word that's, that's just overflowing with too much information. And so you introduce yourself as the one that if we're going to listen to anyone, listen to you. If we're going to respond to anyone, respond to you. If we're going to believe anyone, you said you're the one. And I pray that we would renew our commitment this morning as we stand before you, that we would listen. We are your sheep. We have heard your voice. And we want to listen every day and follow you. Teach us that through your word this morning. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, Jesus says, listen to me three times by three titles. The first one is in verse 14. Listen to Jesus Christ, the amen. Now it's fascinating. Jesus introduces himself, that, that he gives this credential. Amen means Jesus is the yes to all of God's promises. Jesus is the, the yes, it's true. Yes, I will accomplish that in your life. The yes to all of God's promises. This title is only used of Christ here. So in the whole Bible, right here, is the only time Jesus says, I am the amen of God. I am the yes of God. I am the, the opening of all that God has promised. It, it is in me and is through me. In the Old Testament, this is a name for God, so Christ is here taking the title of God from the Old Testament. In fact, in Isaiah 65 and verse 16, God calls himself the Amen. And uh, in fact, if you want to turn there, Isaiah is a huge book in the Old Testament. It's just to the right of the Psalms. 66 chapters, you can't miss it. Go to the Psalms and then go to the right and get to the 65th chapter of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah 65 and verse 16. I want to I want you to think with me, if, if you're sitting in Jerusalem and Isaiah, who lived in Jerusalem, was hearing the voice of God and writing it down, a lot of times when we're working hard, you might hear someone talking, uh, you know, kind of muttering as they're writing something. And I just imagine that if you could hear Isaiah talking in Hebrew, there are two words in this verse that you would have understood, even if he was speaking Hebrew. It's because the word amen is twice in this verse. When God, God calls himself the amen. And, and it's, it's interesting as we read, it's translated truth, but, but it's the actual Hebrew word is amen. And so listen to this and note his words. Verse 16 of Isaiah 65, so that he who blesses himself on earth shall bless himself in, here it is, the God of truth, amen. Truth is amen. And he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of, and there's the word the second time, amen, of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my eyes. Now the Hebrew word truth is amen. And so that's how it sounds, exactly the same. It's transliterated. Transliterated means a word in one language that is not translated. It's just taken the exact sound and structure of it is just dropped into the English language. For example, that happens all the time in the Bible. The word 
In Greek, baptizo is the English word what? Baptism. They just transliterated it. They didn't translate it. They transliterated it. If you translated it, you wouldn't have wrote, written baptism. You would have written to dip, to immerse, to, to uh, uh, you know, pour. There are many word uh, definitions of baptism, but they didn't, they didn't want to get into controversy when they were translating the Bible because there were the sprinklers and there were the pourers and there were the, the immersers, so they just transliterated it. This is a transliteration. It's the word amen. So if you heard Isaiah quoting aloud as he wrote down, you would be listening to him talking in Hebrew, and all of a sudden you would hear the God of amen and the God of amen. So what he's saying is that God is truth, and whatever God says is going to happen. Now, turn to the right to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. And what I want to show you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 is that, that Jesus is the declaration that all that God promised will happen. Jesus is the declaration that everything in the Bible that God promised is going to happen. And Jesus is the one that's going to make that happen. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Paul says the same thing, but he doesn't give this title to Christ, just just the essence of the truth. And it says this, 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yes. You catch that? That all the promises of God in Christ, there's a yes. And in him, here's the word, amen. Now he doesn't make it a title. He just says it as a true statement to the glory of God through us. So all of God's promises, think of this, are attached to Christ. All of God's promises are attached to Christ and they come to us through him. That's what it means to be in Christ. When you're in Christ, you have access to all of the promises of God because all the promises of God are in him and through him. And so, like amen at the end of a prayer, Jesus is the amen at the end of everything God has promised. Now, do you ever you know, type an email or, or text someone, when, when you get done typing out your text, you have to hit send. It doesn't just go by itself. You send. Did you know that Jesus Christ is the send button to the promises of God? All of them are in him. All of them are through him. And he is the yes to everything that God has promised. Now, go back to chapter 3. Of Revelation. So the first thing, remember Jesus is coming with this diagnosis to this assembly, and he first introduces himself. He says, you should listen to me because, number one, I am the, the one in whom are attached, to whom are attached all of God's promises. So you should listen to me if you're concerned about God's promises. I'm the one that sends them to you. I'm the, I'm the one that they are communicated to you. They're through me all of God's promises. Secondly, look what he says in verse 14. We should listen to Christ because he's the faithful and true witness. Not only the amen, the faithful and true witness. That means Jesus, everything he says is true. Whatever he communicates is perfectly accurate, completely trustworthy. He's reliable. Now, most of us trust you know, sources, people, things, until they disappoint us and we find out and then we go, oh, that's not reliable. You know, you can't trust them. They didn't make it in time or they didn't do what they said. They didn't fix it. They didn't whatever. Or they advertised it and it wasn't, I didn't get what they promised. Jesus said, I'm perfectly reliable. Absolutely trustworthy. Whatever I say, exactly what I say, exactly what I promise is what you get. There's so much in our Christian lives we have to take on faith so this title, The Faithful and True Witness, this title, The One Who is the Faithful and True Witness, is so important to us who have to live by faith. You know what faith means? We haven't been there. We haven't seen it. We don't know. We have to take it on faith. But you don't have to take it on blind faith. Because there is one who sees all, who has been there, who has experienced. He says, I have personal experience and I'm a faithful and true witness. You can trust me. So I'm the amen. All God's promises are attached to me. I'm the one that, that 
gives sight to your faith because I am the one who witnesses everything that's promised. Now look at the last one. This is fascinating. The amen, the faithful and true witness. Look at verse 14. And then he says, the beginning of the creation of God. Listen to Jesus Christ. Why? He's the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of everything. The beginning of the creation of God. Now there are a lot of cults that that say that that means he's the first creation of God. That's the essence of Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons. Both the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons are non-Christian because they do not believe Christ is God in human flesh. They believe he's a creature, a created creature. Both of them. They're not Christians. They might use our vocabulary. They might, they might have beautiful ads. They're not Christians because they deny the deity of Christ. The Mormons say he and Satan are brothers. They're both great beings, but they're brothers like angel brothers. The Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus was the first creature God made. He's not God with a capital G, he's God with a little g. He's, he's important, but not God in human flesh. So Jesus says, no, no, I'm not the first creation of God. I'm the beginning of the creation of God. The word is arche. It means the beginning. Jesus is the origin source. The creator is what he's saying. I'm the one that, that initiated creation. I am the one through whom all things were created. I am the before creation, initiator, creator. I'm the beginning of everything that we know about in this universe. Jesus said, I'm the one that began all that. So he says, listen to me, I'm the amen. All of God's promises are attached to me. Listen to me, I'm the, I'm the only one that, that knows everything. I've been there. And you really should listen to me because I'm the creator. I'm the one that began everything. In fact, it says in John 1, 3, all things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that was made. In fact, back up, I want to show you an important one. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about when you open the Bible, you know, it's coming around to January, a lot of people start reading the Bible and they get into Genesis in January. And, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And they think, oh, that was so long ago. And I wonder whether that's real or metaphoric. Is that a fable, a myth? Did he really do it? They forget who is talking there. Look what Colossians 1.15 says. Colossians chapter 1, the 15th verse, is one of the most important verses on Genesis 1 and creation and where we came from than any other passage in the Bible because it says this, He, that's Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Oh, that, what does that mean, firstborn? Does that mean he was created? You know, verse 16, Paul clarifies very powerfully. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before, verse 17, all things, and in him all things consist. Oh, that's what, by the way, the, the word firstborn is prototokos, which means to stand at the head of. Jesus stands at the head of creation, not because he was the first of many creations, but because all creation flowed from him. So what are we getting to? Genesis 1. When you're reading Genesis 1, you're reading about Jesus Christ creating the universe. Jesus Christ breathing into a lump of clay the breath of life. Jesus Christ that came at Christmas time is the creator from the first words of Genesis 1. And he is the beginning of, the originator, the author. He is the prototokos. He's the supreme one over all creation as the creator. So, look at verse 14. The, the, the one to whom all the promises are attached, the amen, and the reliable witness, the verifier, the, the one who is the creator, speaks. And when he speaks, what he says is true. And what no one else can know, he verifies. He's a faithful and true witness. And as creator and beginner, he is the ruler. And he makes them, he makes them decide if they're going to listen to him. I mean, with those three introductions, he has catapulted higher than anybody that could ever speak to anyone. And he looks at this church and he says, this is the diagnosis. 
as the one to whom everything's attached, your salvation, everything else, the one that witnesses everything, I'm omnisciently omnipresent, and I'm your God that created you. Are you going to listen to me? Well, let's listen now to the diagnosis Christ gave them. Look down at verse 17 of Revelation 3. Because Jesus was speaking now to a literal group of people. And if you look them up, you can look them up in any historic source. The Laodiceans were hands down living in the wealthiest city in all of Turkey. It was called Roman province of Asia Minor. And all, at no one disputed that they were the wealthiest city. Laodicea, there were bigger cities like Ephesus, but this was the most concentrated wealth. And so in the wealthiest church of the whole region, there was not a more financially prosperous group of people in all of Asia Minor than Laodicea, and there was not a more spiritually defective church than the church that was in that city. Now look what verse 17 says, because Jesus puts his finger on the problem. Verse 17, because you say, Revelation 3, 17, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. See, Jesus says you have a problem. By all appearance, it's your wealth that's holding you back from pleasing God. Because sanctification means that God is leading and controlling our lives. And often the more financial resources we have, the harder it is to surrender our control. It, it's amazing how, by the way, I, I was just thinking about this this morning. I, I have taken 2,500 people on trips around the world, uh, most often to biblical places, church history, stuff like that. There are two kinds of people that travel with us. There are people that, that they just, wow, they just let you run the show. Then there are the wealthy people that come. And the wealthy people cannot be told what to do. They make most of their own arrangements and they pick and choose what parts of the trip they go on because they are not like everybody else. See, wealth gives us this, this independence. And this church was independent from <laughs> the author, the originator, the Redeemer. Sanctification means that God controls us. But their state of being rich and wealthy and having everything, Jesus diagnosed this church as having all but stopped living under his control. What had happened is they had slowly drifted away. This is the third generation. Remember the first generation, the people that were alive in A.D. 30 that, that knew the risen Christ. The next generation, those that were alive through the ministry of Paul and through the ministry of the apostles through the 60s A.D., the next generation are those that are alive now. It's the grandchildren of the people of the cross. And this third generation says, I'm not sure we need all this. I'm not sure it's that important. And they drifted away. They had cultivated very bad habits. These habits made them unacceptable to Christ. Even worse, it says that they sickened him. And that is what Jesus writes to them. And he says, I want you to repent as often as needed until you are personally pursuing repentance in these seven areas of your life of your spiritual lives. And that's what verses 15 to 19 are all about. And these are the seven habits Christ desires. And here's habit one. Look back at verse 15. We covered this two weeks ago. Habit number one, Jesus wants them and us to repent of any spiritual neutrality. Jesus said, I know your works. You're not cold, you're not hot. I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, you're right in the middle, you're neutral. You're not, you're just right there, kind of going with the flow. I will vomit you out of my mouth. What is that? Spiritual neutrality is when we stop saying no to sin. We don't resist sin. We just say, that's the way it is. That's the way I was born. That's how I'm going to be. Spiritual neutrality or failing to glorify God and allowing him to give us the grace to say no to sin is sickening to Christ. Habit number two, look at verse 17. Jesus said this, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and look at the, the middle part of verse 17, and have need of nothing. Habit number two, Jesus wants us to repent, not only of neutrality, not any longer resisting sin, but of this spiritual self-sufficiency. I can make it on my own kind of attitude. Self-sufficiency is when we think that we don't need the Lord's power, we don't need his guidance, we don't need to pray before our day, we don't need to pray through our day, we don't need to commit everything to him, we don't need to ask for safety, we don't need to ask him for his blessing. We make it. 
We got a good job, we're healthy, you know, top-notch electronics, we always know where we are, you know, what do we need the Lord for? That is self-sufficiency. Another form of self-sufficiency is when we stop seeking God's will before our own will in our decisions in life. It starts becoming weighted by what I want, where I want to go, what I think is best, instead of listening for the Lord's input. Spiritual self-sufficiency is when we stop needing to stay in close contact with the Lord. You know, one of our goals as parents, when you have children, they're your children for life. They can change their name if they want. Genetically, they're your children. That isn't, you know, very hard. That's just uh, one of the biggest challenges, but you have children. The next thing you want is to have them to be your brothers or sisters in Christ. Now, that's really hard. Just getting married and having children, most anybody can do that. Having children that become your brothers and sisters in Christ is a challenge because they usually have to see a little bit of reality, a little spiritual reality. Now, godly parents can have unsafe kids in the home, but one of the greatest challenges is getting those kids to hold hands with the Lord and not getting in the way. And so Bonnie and I prayed. We said, we, you're always our children. We told the kids that. But our goal is that you become our brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know there's one more dimension after that? They can be your children. They can be your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you know what a lot of parents never cultivate? They're not friends. They're really not close. They just let the kids go off. They rarely see them. They're totally out of touch with them. It starts way back in school where they just kind of are gone 90% of the time. And, and what's amazing is the Lord says, if you're a friend of mine, you stay in touch. Think about it as you're reading the Bible. You remember Abraham? Abraham never built anything we know of. He, he owned the promised land. God gave him the title deed to it. He owned it. What did he build? He lived in tents. He never built a house. You know, Bruce Willis just built a $15 million condo in Aspen or something. Abraham had bazillions more than any movie star will ever have. Abraham built nothing but one thing. He built altars. What's an altar? It's a point of contact. It's saying, I want to stay in touch with you. Do you know how, what the sign of a friend is? They stay in touch. You never wonder. You're always in touch with them. Maybe it's real frequent, maybe it's infrequent, but you're in touch enough to always be connected to them. The Lord says, if you're spiritually self-sufficient, you don't stay in close contact with me. You drift away. You start making it on your own. And that sickens me. Now, look at the next part of verse 17. Third habit. Number one, repent of neutrality. Start resisting sin. Number two, repent of spiritual self-sufficiency. Come to me and say, I need you. Number three, verse 17 in the middle. And you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Habit three, Jesus wants us to repent of what I call spiritual insensitivity. What is that? Spiritual insensitivity is when we lose our ability to see we don't allow God's word to be a mirror to help us see our spiritual condition. God's word is the explanation of what God expects from us. And when we lose touch with the mirror of the word, when we lose touch with the ability to be sanctified and cleansed by the word, I remember the great ice storm that hit Tulsa in 08, or no, 07, and it wiped out all the power to Tulsa for three or four days. Uh, it was amazing to see people out. I mean, they didn't even have light in their house. They didn't have hot water. They didn't have the blow dry. Have you seen some people without all the work they do on themselves? I saw people in the store I didn't recognize. Uh, I mean, basically, I looked the same. You know, you just go like that, you know. And boy, they were, woo, they were different. I remember seeing one lady. I said, who is that? Bonnie said, shh, honey. <laughs> That's, you know who? But I said, she looks so different. She says, it's amazing what you can do with all that stuff. But you know what? When you, when you lose the attachment to, to the cleansing and mirroring parts of life, we start declining in what we look like. Jesus said, when you get detached. In fact, let me show you what I mean. Turn to James chapter 1. Uh, you're in Revelation, back up to James. James was probably the first New Testament epistle written. Our Lord's brother, uh, Joseph and Mary, had seven children, six of them between them. One of them was virgin born. Jesus had four brothers, two sisters minimum. And they're all named in the Bible. 
and, and all that's described in the Gospels. But Jesus' oldest brother was James. He became the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. And this is what, what James wrote. Uh, he said, don't be a forgetful hearer. Chapter 1, verse 22. He said, but be doers of the word, not hearers only. James 1, 22. Why? What happens if you only hear and don't do? You deceive yourself. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. In other words, he glances at the mirror, sees something out of place and doesn't care and goes on. And, and that's, that's really a bad condition. Verse 25, here's the good condition. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now, you notice what James did. He, he he used the, the metaphor of a mirror and describes the Bible as the perfect law of liberty. This is the, the transformation agent, the Word of God, through the Spirit of God. But whoever looks into this transformation, spirit-energized book and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. He will be blessed in what he does. Uh, a few weeks ago, Ken Weiss, one of our missionaries, was... Uh, speaking to the men's breakfast and he says i don't like the word apply the bible i don't like to say i apply the bible because he said you can apply paint and it's just sitting on the surface it hasn't done anything to the wall except given an appearance he says i like to embody truth he said i want the truth not to be on the surface of my life i want it to be all the way through my life you know what he's saying here if you want to be blessed in all you do verse 25 don't just look in the bible and forget it do what God says. Okay, let's do a little exercise in that this morning. Do you remember where we were last week? I told you the very first imperative in the book of Romans was where? Chapter 6. Let's go there for a minute. I want to show you what I mean. Because what I didn't tell you last week is Romans 6, 11 has not just the first imperative, it has a string of six in a row compacted together. And I only showed you one, but I want to show you how how we are supposed to live. And basically, the, the concept is this. Anything that's not surrendered to God displeases him. Anything unsurrendered in our lives displeases God. So what does the Lord want? The Lord wants us, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, he wants to show us the pathway of sensitivity spiritually. And, and what that means is, the pathway of being sensitive to checking parts of my life and see if they're under his control or not. Anything that's not under God's control displeases him because he is Lord and Master. In fact, you all know the, the verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present yourselves. This is the pathway to presentation. Look at chapter 6, starting in verse 11. Paul begins a string of six imperatives or commands. Now remember, each of these, we have to decide what we're going to do with them. First one, likewise you also, verse 11, here's the first one, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Now we covered that last week. That means operate on what you know to be true. Believe God and respond to him. Okay, that's the intro. How do you do that? Look at the next verse. Here's the second imperative. Therefore, here's the imperative, do not let. That's, that's a command. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Now, if we're supposed to operate on what we know to be true, then we are supposed to say no to sin. Every one of us have a sin that so easily besets us. And, and we need to operate on what we know is true. That sin does not have to beset us. It's almost like a person that they get up in the morning, they walk out the front door, and a person stands there and says, give me your wallet, and they give them their wallet. And, and every morning they walk out the door and they walk down, that per same person standing there and says, give me your wallet, and, and they just get in this pattern of responding to the assailant. You know what the Bible says? The next time sin comes and says, give me your wallet, you say, no. Why? Because... Jesus has set me free from being under the power of that one that wants to take from me. Say no to sin because sin is defeated. And we have to treat it that way. Say no, turn away in the power of the Spirit and be amazed at God's power. You know, there's no sin 
that has taken us, but God is faithful and he always makes an exit door. See that nice E-X-I-T sign? God always makes a way of escape. All we have to do is say no, and he gives us the grace to, to depart from that situation of being defeated, of being taken into sin's clutches. Look at verse 13. Here's the third imperative. First one, reckon yourself, operate on what you know to be true. Second one, verse 12, say no to sin, do not let sin reign. Third one, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. When we sin, it's not I sinned, it's my mind sinned, or my, I surrendered my tongue to say something I should have said, or I surrendered my mind to think thoughts, or I surrendered my ears to listen to that, that prayer request that was just actually lightly veiled gossip, and I sinned by listening at something that I have no part of, that it just satisfies me to know that someone else is hurting. I mean, we, bad news is like, uh, uh, Mark Twain says, you know, truth is stumbling when bad news is, is around the world in an instant. We love to listen to stuff and we surrender to sin or we surrender our eyes or we surrender our hands. Don't, verse 13, look, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. What that means is break the old pattern. Just like at the bottom of the stairs every morning, you would hand your wallet to the person that was stealing it. Stop doing that. Break the pattern. Don't follow sinful patterns. They're like ruts. You anticipate them, you hold tightly to the wheel, and you stay out of the rut. I mean, I grew up in Lansing, East Lansing, Bath Township, in this unpaved road, and every time it rained, it would just, you'd fishtail in the mud, and it would rain more, and you'd sink in the mud, and then fall, and, and the first frost would come, and the mud would harden. My parents used to always say, don't, don't go in those ruts. They're too deep and it'll hurt the under part of the car and you'll end up getting stuck in them. And so straddle the ruts. And so you didn't just drive anywhere in the road, you look for the ruts and you purposely put your tires on both sides, not into them. You broke the pattern of the ruts. And so you, you stay out of the ruts, but if you slide into them, you get right back out by the grace of God. Break the old pattern, verse 13. Do not present your members. Steer clear of the old patterns. That's the third imperative. Fourth one, here's the positive. That was do not present. Right in the middle of verse 13 it says, but, and here's the positive form, present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. So present yourselves to God. Start following God as a daily choice. Th that means that when we get up in the morning, the first thing we think about is not communicating with electronica and getting lost in there, but checking in with God and saying, I want to offer my mind, my, my mouth, my ears, my eyes, my hands as your slaves, as your servants. I want to be an instrument of righteousness in your hand. Now look at verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, there's the next imperative, slaves to obey. So we have the opportunity to present ourselves as a slave to obey someone. You are that one slave whom you obey. Here are the two choices. Verse 16 says, whether of sin, we can present ourselves as a slave to sin, leading to death, or present our slaves as slaves of obedience, leading to righteousness. Do you see? We have a choice, and it's an imperative. Present yourself as slaves, not to sin, but to obedient righteousness. I call this enlist yourself each day as a slave of Christ. Go to him and say, I want you to be my master. I'm willing again to present myself back into your hands. That's the content of the prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, we studied? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Focus me that you are God. Thy kingdom come, control me. That's what thy kingdom come means, control me. Thy will be done, lead me through life. Give me this day my daily bread. Supply me what I need to accomplish your purposes. Forgive me my trespasses. Keep me cleansed. Deliver me from evil. Protect me. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory. Empty me. That's the progression of a slave checking in with their master. And we're supposed to do that every day. And here's the last one. Look at verse 19. The last imperative. I speak in human terms. 
because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness to more lawlessness, so now, here's the key. This is the most important element of this list of imperatives. Verse 19, right at the end. So now, and here's the imperative, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. God says, I'm waiting for a response from you. Get passionate about being righteous, about holy living, about presenting your members as slaves of righteousness for the purpose of holiness. Get, get passionate about every part of my life reflecting God. Remember the old WWJD bracelets that, that everyone wore for a while? What would Jesus do? Did you know you can do that without the bracelet? That's what he's saying. Present your members. It, it, it's, it's possible to say, Lord, what would you do? How do you want me to live? You have called me. You have empowered me. I can be a slave to you. I can live separated onto your glory and away from what displeases you. Well, the message is, are you listening to Jesus? He's the highest authority. He's the amen. All the promises are attached to him. He's a faithful and true witness. He knows what happens. He's witnessed. And he, he tells us reliably that if you do this, it makes me sick. And you're going to face my wrath. And, and I'm going to have to chasten you. But if you do this, my blessing will be on your life. Who are you going to listen to? Spiritual insensitivity is no longer allowing the Word of God to be the mirror that we look at to adjust our life. We close this, become insensitive to this, and we start following another voice as our authority, not the voice of the Word, the voice of whoever we admire and we become looking more like who or whatever that is instead of looking more like Christ as our master. So Jesus, the most respected authority on spiritual health in the universe, called the Laodiceans and every one of us to repent of all spiritual insensitivity. How? Number one, start operating on the truth. Jesus has set me free. Start saying no to sin. In fact, you want to do something? Pick, pick whatever it is, whatever that so easily besets you, and say no. I'm not going to respond in anger. I'm not going to respond in, in slanderous ways. I'm not going to respond in gossip. I'm not going to respond in lust. I'm not going to respond in fear. Say no to sin. Start breaking the old patterns. Start following God daily as a choice. Start checking in and presenting yourself as his slave Start pursuing a passion. You know, I, I'm, I'm meeting people all the time. You are too. There are two people here that I see. I tell them, hey, don't lose any more weight. I'm not going to be able to see you. You know, you're getting so thin. You know what, what each of those people, they have decided they're going to alter their lives for a purpose. And they've decided they're going to eat less and they're going to exercise. And that's wonderful. And that shows you can do almost anything you set your mind to. And that's why the Lord says, why don't you enlist with me and allow me to transform you every day you look into my mirror to look more like me because that's what pleases me. Let's stand for a word of prayer. And as we stand, at every service, there's two things I always remind you of. Number one, if you'd like to talk with someone about what you just heard, in fact, you say, I, I, I want to do something. I don't know what to do. I want to pray with someone. There are godly men and women, the elders of Calvary Bible Church, as well as our Titus II, godly older women in the faith, always stand here at the end of the service. They will be right here. They have their Bible. They'd love to go off and sit with you or stand here and answer a question and pray with you. That's number one. So if you need to nail down that presenting yourself as a slave to righteousness, don't leave. Let someone talk with you, connect with you. Number two, if you're new, and, and by new I mean if you've been here 
for a day, a month, a week, a year, or whatever, but, but I've never met you yet. You're new. I haven't met you. Uh, come to the Fellowship Center. I'd love to meet you. It's our guest reception. Bring your newcomers there. Uh, we have a great time every week. We have a little packet, uh, just some wonderful things we give out. That's right after the service. Tonight, we're going to have a wonderful question and answer uh, session. It's going to be about reprobation, election, predestination, the five points of Calvinism, and which of them are biblical and which of them are not biblical, they're just logical, but they're not in the Bible. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? And we'll have that tonight. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you. We want to listen to you. Lord Jesus, you're the amen. And if we care at all about the promises of God, they come attached to you. You're the reliable witness. We don't have to live in blind faith. We can embrace a living, reliable, faithful and true witness Savior. And you are the beginning. You stand at the head of all creation as the creator. And we are wise to listen to you. And I pray that we would start daily checking in, saying no to sin and yes to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.